They have announced the July launch of the CBDC, and that feels like as good a deadline as any. They've been killing the crypto rails, right? They killed Signature, they killed Silvergate. There aren't that many ways out. And so what I wanted to do was say, get Bitcoin, get your friends and family to get Bitcoin, get your coins off exchanges and do that now because they might close the doors, they might bar the exit. So you know, Paul Revere, the printing is coming. Pomp. Good to good to see you. Um, you can you can see that I'm like a, you know still normal guy or what have you, right? <laughs> um, but Let, basically, let's, let's start here. Sorry, yeah. Let, let's start yeah, sure. here, Blaji. Uh, sure. I think a lot of people saw you put the bet out, and they're all focused yep. on the bet. But to me, the right. bet is merely you sounding the alarm. And so exactly. let's go let's go back to 2020. And walk us through what happened to get to the point where you believe the banks are now insolvent. Like, how did we get here? Great question. So, if you actually go and you look at my um, my post on this, okay. So, why did I do this? Actually, I I did not propose the bet. I accepted the bet. Right. He he's the one who made the bet over here. Number one and number two is he did that after I put out my initial. I thought I would do tasks. And so on for people like they would go and go and uh, do tasks for Bitcoin, right? But it was a good way to. This actually got 11 million views. It was a good way to bring attention to the key point, which is everything. The narrative outlined in this post here, and this fortunately got 2.3 million views. Okay, because this is the core set of concepts. You only read one post. Read this. Okay, I'm just going to go through it. Can you see the screen? I can. Okay, so. Got a post uh, right here. Um, so this basically, you know, this was a bet thread, but the point of it was actually get people to read this. Okay, just as in two thousand eight, the bankers lied. We forgot how much they had lied to us because you know that was that was obviously a huge thing in two thousand eight. They basically almost bankrupted the world economy, lying to us, lying to themselves, some competence, combination of greed and competence, malice or whatever, blowing up the whole world economy. Right? This time, the central bankers, the banks, and the bank regulators have lied to all dollar holders and depositors. It's not your typical fractional reserve situation. There is enough in the banks on a mark to market basis to cover withdrawals. Um, I, I call it Uncle Sam Bankman Freed. Okay, that's actually if you want one line. Just like Sam Bankman Fried, he uh, you know, he owed people, let's say, a thousand Bitcoin, right? But when they but and he had some balance sheet that said his assets added up to a thousand Bitcoin. And he fooled himself or he fooled the rest of the company or whatever it was into thinking he actually had that. But he was actually like gambling and all this other stuff. And he may marked it at what he had when he bought it, but he didn't have it when people came. And when people actually came, he couldn't liquidate those assets to actually get the Bitcoin that they wanted because he had gone and gambled it, right? And uh, and then, of course, the entire exchange collapsed, right? This is basically what has happened, not just at FTX, but at all the banks. All the banks bought long-dated US treasuries as well as other bonds in 2021. They binged on bonds, as I'll show you in a second, okay? They binged on bonds. And... Um, the basically in, in response to the Fed's guidance, here's here's the article. Do you see this? Banks are binging on bonds, but not because they want to. Do you see this? Smoking yes. gun article, right, from 2021 shows enormous increase in buying of all these bonds and less commercial loans. They all got centralized on one guy, Uncle Sam, right? Buy bonds, even if it means skimpy profits. So they have to invest in one of the least lucrative assets around government debt. Guaranteed to produce skimpy profits, right? And uh, actually, what happened was basically that um, all the printed money from 2020 sloshed around the economy and it cut off the normal flow of normal loans because customers had you know high levels of cash finance. They normally didn't take out loans, so it broke the banking model. So all they did is they put all this enormous amounts of cash into bonds, and when the yield on the uh, treasury note rose to 1.75%, Banks hungry for higher returns rushed to buy them. So this was like 1.75% was like a high return in 2021, August 2021, right? And moreover, and that spike didn't last, right? So by the way, this is all like banking gobbledygook to many people, right? But um, part of the thing about this, I'll explain the simplest terms I can, right? First, what you should do, right? What you should do is 
buy Bitcoin, get your coins off exchanges, and go to a crypto-friendly jurisdiction. Inside the US, that'll be like Florida or Texas or something like that. Outside the US, which might actually be better, honestly, as I'll get to, would be like El Salvador actually, or UAE, or um, you know, uh, like Singapore and so on. Like Western Europe, not so much. You know, any basically the closer it is to Blue America in a network sense, you know. Japan is far away from Blue America, but it's very connected to Blue America in the sense of having lots of US dollar deposits. Um, the closer it is to Blue America in a network sense, the more it banked on the Fed and the worse off it is, okay? And just to give you a sense of what actually happened, first I'll show you some graphs, okay? Because graphs get the point across. Um, this is a graph of like how much treasury is making. Look at that, just down into the right, okay? This is a graph of how, meaning I mean, they're, they're, they're losing money. Okay, Treasury, the central bank is losing money. It doesn't look like normal normal times, okay? Um, this is a graph of uh, unrealized losses. Okay, and this is really like the core bomb that's blowing up this whole thing. All of these- And Balaji, Balaji right. just so people understand, the chart that we're looking at here, this is unrealized losses for the banks, the actual uh, yes. large banks, mid-sized banks, small banks. This is their unrealized losses that are sitting on their balance sheets that they don't necessarily have to mark to market. Yeah, unless you actually come and ask for your dollars. Okay. If you ask for your cash, there'll be an Uncle Sam Bakeman Freed situation where they don't have the dollars on hand to make up for it. But that's what happened with S uh, Silicon Valley Bank. That's what happened with other banks. Credit Suisse has now just admitted it was a bank run that got them. And the digital age bank runs are very fast. Once people hear that something's possibly insolvent, they all just go and pull their money out, right? And so the the whole concept of, oh, they'll only ask for this much at this time, that's no longer the case. You could have everybody do an outflow at the same time if it goes viral. And on and that so, point, I think it on that point, I think it's very important to um to kind of understand that what you're talking about is not just the flow of information being fast, but you're also talking about the fact that now for a bank run to occur, you don't have to go sit in line and yes. or stand in line at the bank. You can literally open a new tab, press a couple buttons, and move your money. And so the speed of yep. action matches the speed of information, and that's really what's driving a lot of these problems. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so essentially, the digital bank run is. I mean, we we were pushed into this era by the Fed, as I'll get to. Basically, um, you know, th these graphs. Okay, they're down into the right graphs. They're huge. I mean, this is 2008 for comparison, right? These are enormous, enormous yawning, you know, numbers here, right? And here is um, here's the community banks. Okay, so this is these are the commercial banks, and this is the central bank. Okay, and then the community banks. Here's the Fed admitting that um, you know the rising interest rates have. And again, all this is in jargon. And it's jargon, just like you know, it's like camouflage for a snake. You know, a snake has evolved camouflage. It didn't design the camouflage, but if it didn't have the camouflage, you'd be able to catch it and kill it, right? So. All of these words are ways for them to hide the ball from you. Fine print is not simply a tactic, it's their strategy, right? The, you know, in 2008, you, they would have used mocking terms on you. They would have said something like, tell me you don't know what a CDO is without telling me you don't know what a CDO is, okay? And the whole point is that nobody knows what a CDO is. Neither the guy selling it nor the guy buying it. They're all, some guys are lying, some guys are lying to themselves, some guys are lying to their counterparty, some guys are just stupid. Nobody asked the obvious question of, this thing isn't worth what we think it's worth. And if you did say that, oh, I can't believe, I mean, they'd be marking down the portfolio. So nobody wanted to believe that until somebody poked around enough and found actually these houses, nobody's making payments on them, right? And in the same way, unrealized loss is lowering tangible equity capital. Basically what they're saying is, um, at the, at the end of 2021, four banks had, you know, tangible equity. This is this thing they've made up, tangible equity capital. TLDR is at the end of 2021, four banks were insolvent. By June 30th, they knew 333 of these community banks were insolvent. Meaning if there was an economic shock, go ahead. If you came for the money, the money was gone. Go ahead. And that comes specifically for those that uh, are trying to understand what happened there. At the end of 2021, rates were still at 0%. By June, it was very clear that they were hiking rates, and we're going to continue to oh, hike by rates. March. So, yeah, yeah, and but it was a surprise. By June, it was very, it was very severe, and it was obvious that they were now underwater on the debt that they had bought. Yeah, the thing, the thing to remember is this is like you know how in so many other contexts, right? Uh, masks don't work before they do, right? 
you're a right-wing conspiracy theorist, blah, blah, blah. If you're saying the coronavirus is even here and you shouldn't wear masks, oh my God, everybody needs to wear a mask at all times, blah, 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 right? And the science has said this, right? And they just, for, you know, they either truly forget or they don't want to remember. They just shift like a school of fish, right? Uh, the lab leak, obviously a conspiracy theory. Oh, I always had suspicions about the lab leak. Why wouldn't you? Seems like a reasonable thing, right? Inflation, and this is a big one, right? Inflation, see, you can do that maybe for some political stuff, right? Um, but when you when you do it, when you're actually signing a contract at the flip before the flop, then everybody's screwed, okay? And that's what happened. Essentially, back when the political class was just denying things, stop worrying about inflation, right? Inflation fear lurks, even as officials say not to worry. Powell Dowd plays inflation risks as Yellen foreshadows future spending, right? And then, whoop, like this, okay? So, you know, again, people who are watching this don't need to know how interest rates work, but essentially what they did was they faked out everybody. Everybody who's making long-term plans, they said inflation was a conspiracy theory. It's not real. You buy 10-year bonds. That denial continued through 2021. Then the rates just got hiked super fast in one year higher than 10 years. Everybody who was a bondholder got destroyed, including SVB by many others, all by the Fed. This is what happened, right? Everybody who trusted the Fed, everybody who made essentially a long-term bet in 2021 on the, the, the full faith and credit of the US government, on the financial health, 10-year bond, it's supposed to be a stable country. It's not supposed to go wee, 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 up and down like this, right? Um, they got destroyed, absolutely destroyed. Basically, in a sense, if you still thought America was the same country in mid-2021 and you still kept doing what you were doing, then you weren't doing the right thing. Clearly, the country had just permanently changed, right? Even if, you know, like what had happened before in 2020 with the crazy riots and so on and so forth, all of that now became the government. And so th that kind of went now, it's, it's like swallowing the poison, right? And so everybody, you know, the form may have been the same, but the substance is now totally different, right? And, um, you know, so I said, like inflation is a case where yesterday's conspiracy theory became today's conventional wisdom. The issue is all kinds of contracts got, see, you know, a lot of folks claiming that SVB was a victim of the industry. They, they weren't that big and they weren't a shock. The thing is, this is just either, it's either delusional or it's wrong or it's whatever. But, you know, as, as I mentioned over here, even Janet Yellen has admitted that uh, the high interest rate environment, basically that caused people to lose market value. I mean, duh, right? And everybody's like, oh, why don't you just hedge interest rate risk? Well, because you can hedge if it goes from like point. 1% to 1.1%. You can't hedge if it's 0.1%. It goes to 4.75%. It just completely destroys all of your projections. So just showing you that. Um, but I'm going to jump out of the banker stuff in a second, because as I said, the whole point of it is it's being naturally selected to be very confusing and to not know where things are, right? But the, but basically, just to give you a sense, they project in December 2020, is going to be 0.1 forever, right? Everybody who's trying to make long-term decisions is buying long-term bonds. And then, oh my God, it's actually 4.75% in 2023. Shit, you know, I'm now I'm totally crushed, right? Because the rate totally changed. And you can see actually a record of their forecasts and how they change over time. Now, the thing about this is to understand these forecasts, billions and billions and billions of dollars are based on them. And when they wiggle like this, because they're such conformists that they go up and down and up and down, right? When they wiggle at that extent, it like whiplashes the entire economy and causes all kinds of things to break and shatter and so on. Because all these pension funds and all these things that buy it on their guidance, trust them, and then they all go off a cliff at the same time like lemmings. And that's basically what happened. So it's so coming back up the stack. Um, you know, here we are. So basically, they all knew this huge crash was coming. Okay. So all the stuff on interest rates and so on, um, you don't have to worry about that too much. I mean, it's it's kind of the backstory to this, right? But the main point is the banks, central banks, the banks and banking regulars all knew a huge crash was coming. The phrase is unrealized losses, but they never notified you, the depositor. Instead, they allow, the regulators allowed banks to hide their literal insolvency and in footnotes until one guy figured it out, okay? And so here, just take a look at this, ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, I guess I'm the only one using Twitter Blue to its fullest. <laughs> when I saw you use this, I literally said Twitter Blue was made for Balaji footnotes. This is amazing. 
right? So, cause I'm not like, this is not, oh, you some crazy guy just saying this, blah, blah, blah. I have names and dates and specific links in their archive. So I'm just going to show you five links that show that the central bank, which is a fed, the banks and the banking regulators all knew a huge crash was coming, but they never notified you, the depositor. Instead, they allowed banks to hide their literal insolvency and footnotes until somebody figured it out. Okay. So link number one, here's the fed. Okay. All the banks are insolvent. 333 community banks versus four over here. Okay. And by the way, people will be like, oh, how'd they hide it, huh? They publish it on the web. That's really hiding it, right? It's called, you know, well, you call it hiding in plain sight. Or you could say, all right, did they tell the depositors, the millions of like Republicans and so on, that the banks had lost their money? You know, that that the Fed had told the banks to lose their money? Did you notify the depositors? Publishing this coded kind of thing on their website does not say in plain English that if you came for your dollars, it would not be there, right? So it's not, it's like a non-disclosure disclosure, right? Here's another one, you know, FDIC worried about growing unrealized losses in banks' portfolios. It's a very substantial overhang. It could impact our institutions. It's $400 billion. I mean, it's starting to be real money, right? Okay. And, um, and it's because the Fed raised rates, okay? Then here, is that same guy, FDIC chair, just two or three days before SVB saying, unrealized losses weaken a future bank's ability to meet economic needs, right? Um, the total was $620 billion, right? And, uh, you know, just, just absolutely gigantic numbers, okay? Here, the Fed itself, okay, in Fed minutes, February 23, again, this stuff is written, it's like verbally encrypted, you know? <laughs> it's like ostensibly disclosed, but it's not. The effect of large unrealized losses on bank security portfolios so they did know that you know basically you know powell the day later right went and you know on march 7th he went and testified to congress on march 6th was this fdic thing march 7th he went to congress and um he said something to the effect of that the banks were solvent right but the fed lied banks died right that's basically you know if you want to get to the core of it once basically the the fed had basically passed off See, the Fed raised these rates and the value of bonds banks uh, own dropped. What happened was all the banks panicked. They're like, oh, crap. We all listened to the Fed. We all went and uh, they all went and binged on bonds. Okay. And, uh, you know, here's where is it? There's binging on bonds. They listened to the Fed. They binged on bonds. They all got destroyed at the same way at the same time. And then what do they do? They're like, what should they do in reaction to the large losses, right? Like, you know, the resulting impact on capital. They were scared. The Fed had just surprised them and just destroyed their entire portfolio, right? Anxious bankers wondering what they should do. And so they decided to do is transfer securities to HTM, okay? What the heck is HTM? Um, oh, it's uh, it's basically like hold to maturity. It, uh, it's basically like Sam Bankman Fried going and buying something. It gets marked down 60%, but he says it's still worth what it was. It's like your NFT. You still think it's a worth a million dollars. No, it's not worth a million dollars. Okay. No one's going to pay you a million dollars for it, but you hold to maturity. Oh, actually, no, sorry. It's a little different than that. People always will want the technicality. Oh, no. It's an NFT that will return, that pays you 1% each year and it will return a million dollars in, you know, eight or nine more years. But if you, uh, but today, there's another one that you can buy for the same amount that returns you 5% each year or whatever. And so your one is worth way less by comparison. They'll always want to be like, oh, that specific typo or, you know, like slight imprecision means. But the substance of it is that they did some accounting magic to hide their gigantic losses. And um, this was true at many different banks, like SVB also did this. Evidence of deception by SVB management where... Um, they used to have a very clean line showing those securities. Then they made it, you know, reserve, reserve, right? And then suddenly, oh, ta-da, 491.8. Like, basically, they, the regulators allowed the bank to hide their literal insolvency in a footnote. Okay? Oh, yeah, you know, we just moved things around, $81.6 billion. Not a big, $81.6 billion, more than the GDP of a small country, put in a footnote. And this is what set up the situation where... Um, some engineer at, you know, Dropbox or whatever, you know, like some, you know, uh, some employee of some tech company goes to work one day, finds that their company's bank account, the money is gone in some American bank that they thought they could trust for, you know, 40 years. 
and wanting their business checking account back is blamed on them, right? Like, think about, you know, how insane that is. And I was like, how could that possibly have happened, right? And, and one of the things that's going on here, by the way, is, you know how, um, if you're, you know, in San Francisco, right, you pay for all the police and get none of the protection, okay? It's what's called anarcho tyranny, okay? So that's like, uh, you're, you're, you're an Uber driver and you're in San Francisco and uh, you get a $200, $300 parking ticket, okay, for doing nothing. But the guy who smashes your window and, and you know, wilds out in the street, nothing happens to them, okay? So that's a tyranny and the anarchy at the same time, right? Similarly, this is like an arc of tyranny, but for banks, where somehow the money can be gone overnight. That's the anarchy. But the tyranny is 5,000. Why the heck is this stupid? I mean, all these forms and all this verbiage there, but the regulator doesn't know that the bank is insolvent, didn't warn depositors. You find out in a bank run with all of these filings. That was, that was what I was trying to figure out. How, when did this actually happen? And then I pulled on that and I pulled on that and I pulled on that until I could add up what I was seeing in front of me. And I was like, they're all dead. This is just the first bank that floated up to the surface. All the banks are dead and they're just going to keep coming up. And so, you know, that's why I tweeted this and nobody else ever is like, uh, you know, March 11th, as soon as I kind of, I got on this like a dog on a bone, because I was like, how the heck could a $200 billion bank go to zero like this? And it's like, oh, that wasn't a unique cause of them as treasury. Because they're always trying to blame it on, oh, they did risky VC bets and so No, they bought treasuries, which was like supposedly the safest asset in the world, right? And so even on March like 11th, right, I was like, what we'd like to see in the coming weeks wasn't a single bank issue, it was a central bank issue, right? Most banks are suffering unrealized losses thanks to rapid change. And people are like, no, no, you're trying to make special heating, right? And there's all kinds of weird optical illusions that people have in this space. They like worship the Fed. Oh my God, I can't believe you're blaming the Fed. They think of the Fed as like, like a god or the referee or something where you're not supposed the to of like- Oz. Yeah, exactly. And you know, the thing is, I this kind of stuff always bored me, frankly, because I was, you know, it's, it's like, it's kind of meant, it's a lot of money for sure, but it's also written in such a way as to be boring and complex. But point being though, that, um, this was 10 days ago. I was like, you know, we're going to not a single bank issue, central bank issue. That was, that was basically, um, bef so that was before. So, you know, they, they basically, we now have five banks dead, right? There's Silvergate, there's, um, Signature, there's SVB, there's First Republic and there's Credit Suisse. And, some of them are dead and some of them are murdered, right? But uh, clearly it's not a single thing. And moreover, the new WSJ, dozens of banks may have risk to similar, similar silicon value. 186 banks may be prone to similar risk. Who knows if it's 186 or if it's 333 or if it's, um, you know, like many, or in this case, he's like, uh, you know, I always say he says, most banks have a, like, what is the exact number of dead banks? Who knows? Okay. But what happened after the SVB thing was found out is the Fed moved into, because I think they were trying to figure, they were trying to hope that there would never be a bankrupt or something like yeah. SBF. No one would ever come looking for their money. Right. And just so Balaji, it on, real, real, it, yeah. real quick before, uh, before we get into what happened with the Fed kind of stepping in, what I want to also just call out very quickly is that a huge part of this was all of the stimulus, all of the quantitative easing, all yes. the bailouts, all all of this stuff that happened between 2020 and it's called 2022. One of the key things that uh, people focused on was inflation, the rise of prices that people were paying attention there. But I had an aha as I was reading your tweets and, and kind of looking at more of it is like, guess where all of that money ended up, regardless of if an individual or a corporation had it, is it ended up in a bank. And mm -hmm. so it was a deposit right. somewhere, right? It, if yes. I received a $1,200 check and then I turn around and I give it to a business, that business puts it in a bank as a deposit. And so the quote unquote big winners throughout 2020 and 2021 was the bank deposits growing at hundreds of percent, which then basically now put them in a position where they had to figure out what do we do with all these new deposits? And that's really kind of what led to them buying these long duration bonds because of the zero interest rate environment, put them all at ma massive risk. And so we get to the failure of SBB, and maybe you can explain kind of what the Fed and kind of other organizations are doing by stepping in here. Yeah. So, so basically, um, I mean, it goes back even further, right? Because 
you know, if people have known like the U.S. is living on borrowed time for a long time, you know, that it's been printing so much money. It's had like it's a zombie economy for a while, right? Um, you know, bail out of GM, bail out of this, right? All kinds of things just got tons of money to stay afloat. And you have, for example, like the Marvel reruns, you know, all that type of stuff where um, you have 75, 80-year-old presidents, you know, all of that stuff, right? So you can you can pull it back to the pandemic, you can pull it back to the financial crisis, you can pull it back probably further than that, you know, and uh, there's probably steps that people could have taken at any one given moment. Um, but specifically with the pandemic, yeah, you're correct, that huge amounts of money sloshed onto the balance sheet of banks, they had to do something with it. Everybody else also had lots of money, they weren't taking out loans. So the banks also did think maybe inflation is going to come, but they knew the Fed was denying that they were going to hike rates. So they're like, okay, fine. Um, we're going to just instead um, buy these crappy bonds that we've got now and get these 10 years. And then when Powell hiked rates so fast, so quickly, nobody could find a counterparty for their huge bond portfolios because they're all in the same boat at the same time because expressing a different opinions, so all these lemmings just went off a cliff and everybody was just hoping that the Fed would eventually pivot, right? And now they have because after SVB, they've decided, okay, rather than having people just go and withdraw you know, their money and cause a bank run. No, instead, we're going to just print money behind every depositor, F Fed DIC insurance. Okay. And so now the game, now it's now we're an end game. Okay. Because now what they have done, what that is, is it's a stealth monetization of the debt. All of the all the debts that they owe, they have now just magic them away. And they don't want to call it that. But one of the clever things is that these bondholders, um, now they they are so happy to have their losses deleted by the Fed that they're probably not realizing that the amount of money injected into the system, like for example, you buy a billion dollar bond, okay, you just lost fifteen percent on it or something like that, and the Fed says, you know, I'm going to value, so it's it's eight hundred fifty million. Oh crap! And the Fed says, you know what, I'm going to still value that at a billion and this BTFP program. They're like, the markdown didn't happen. And, and they do something complicated. It's not exactly buying it, some loan kind of thing. But the the point of it, though, is um, that you got your your billion and, rather than your 850 million. You got that extra money, the 150, you know. And so you're feeling happy at that time. And I don't know what the exact contracts are that they signed, but that bank that you know was killed by the Fed and now saved by the Fed is happy. But I wouldn't be surprised if they signed something that says, Oh, you can't accuse us of it of being a sovereign default. But now, ta-da, they have managed to get people to eat that sovereign default. And now they just hope that basically the level of inflation that's in the system, where they've just increased the money supply so dramatically, is not something that's going to flow into Bitcoin. And and like I know everything I'm saying here just sounds like really complicated and intricate and like hard to track or whatever. But the TLDR is imagine if. Sam Bankman Freed, he had these assets, you know, he he owed you a thousand Bitcoin. People came back and he only had 400 Bitcoin. And he had assets that he thought were worth 600 Bitcoin. Um, he couldn't sell those to get 600 Bitcoin. But then suddenly in comes the government and issues him stuff over here, new Bitcoins, and he could give them back. That won't work for Bitcoin because you can't print Bitcoin. The 21 million limit is actually, it's such a simple but important hard constraint on the entire system, right? Whereas with the Fed, they can swoop in behind the scenes and start printing dollars such that these guys can make good on their obligations, right? And that is what has happened, where there's essentially like both domestic and international bailouts. Now, by the way, just to take temperature, um, on a one to a 10, uh, you know, I should probably tweet this. Do you, are you aware or do you believe that a financial crisis has happened? I'm the wrong person to ask because I know that we not only uh, are going to have a financial crisis, I know that we are in one and it is yes. way more drastic than most people realize. Hence why yes. uh, I'm spending so much time talking about this. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's right. So this is the stealth financial crisis. That's actually why. See, because NYT and others, they're all pointing your attention at something else. They're not front paging this intentionally because they don't want you to panic. Don't panic. Whatever you do, you know, like remember FTX is fine, assets are fine, right? That's exactly what's happening now. Treasury and and you know, uh Fed have statements out saying we're solvent. Money is there. Don't worry, you know? All the banks are good. Full faith and credit. Blah blah blah. 
And of course, when you have to put that statement out, that's obviously when um, things aren't going good, you know? So what I, again, the simple version of what I think happens, and there could be a lot of twists and turns, is it's really going to be one of two things. First, um, lots of, there's all kinds of chaotic printing and bank runs and so on in the weeks to come as worried depositors check on their funds. And the big branch point is whether they wire it to big banks or where they turn into Bitcoin. And that determines basically whether literally like whether freedom lives, as funny as that sounds, okay? Because if everybody wires to big banks, then, and they think, oh my God, the Fed saved us, the big banks saved us, and all the small banks and all the tech banks and so on die. Well, the Fed now, CBDC, which they chose, by the way, to announce even in the middle of this crisis, okay? They announced it on March 15th, it's going to come out in July, okay? Then... All the money is trapped at all the big banks. And then in July, you only have like four banks left or whatever it is. The CBDC is rolled out and too big to fail becomes like too big to escape. You literally can't spend your money without government approval on anything. Oh, you want to buy that? Beep, beep. Nope, that guy is bad. That person, you can have very fine grain pulling of every single transaction anybody's ever done. You can't exit the system. It is like, it becomes like uh, you go from a free person to having monopoly points on somebody's computer. It's even more than, I mean, the Fed system has become more like that even, you know, right? And whoever they don't like, they delete them. And whoever they like, they they add them. And the whole CBDC basically makes all kinds of monkeying around with individual people's balances much easier to do, right? And that is what China is certainly doing, right? So anybody who's politically unfavorable to the regime, they freeze, they can seize, they can spy, they can do whatever, right? And who's politically favorable, they just direct deposit somebody else's money and nobody can see it, right? So, um, you know, it, and then of course they can cut off interconvertibility into cryptocurrency. They just won't let somebody buy or sell it for that, or at least not without, without knowing about it. Um, and you can imagine maybe OTC trades where the second part of that, you know, like the, the BTC part of it isn't shown, but they, they won't like it, right? So, so the current path before setting up the bit signal was something where, and again, how intentional is it versus how emergent, I don't know. But the current path was uh, that the Fed causes this crisis, bankrupts all the banks. Um, you know, one of them has a bank run. Fed rolls in. They're both arsonist and firefighter. Somehow they know exactly what's about to happen, right? FDIC rolled in real, they're real professionals, right? Actually, they they knew the bank, everything was insolvent, right? And um, then what happened was um, that uh, with all of these small banks, the tech banks, community banks going down and all the money pinned at the central bank uh, or at the, at the big banks, um, the CBDC rollout becomes very simple. You just have four banks and really all the same. And now you don't have any choice. And the alternative to that though, is if people buy Bitcoin, that is literally the exit from the system. It is something that they cannot control. They cannot edit the entries on that ledger. That's the whole point. It's this bulletproof decentralized ledger. And uh, the 21 million number, they can't corrupt it and they can't censor it. And... Um, <laughs> This whole thing, everything that we've ever talked about here, you know, you and me for 10 years. On and, you know, what's funny is um, I am not, neither of us, I don't think, you know, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, but we're all going to be Bitcoin maximalists now. Okay. What I mean by that is the Bitcoin maximalist philosophy. And again, I've recognized that many of its exponents and so on are like insane and it's all true. But unfortunately, you're going to kind of need insane people for what is about to happen. Okay. Their worldview is the closest. Most people, most of people don't have any idea of what's coming. Okay. But Bitcoin maximalists are maybe the only people on earth who are prepared for the potential sovereign default of the US dollar and the rise of Bitcoin and the concept of hyper Bitcoinization where the reserve currency switches over to BTC and all fiat around the world like basically collapses relative to the hardest money around, right? And basically what the what the US has done, what the Fed has done is it's caused the fiat crisis. It's not really just a banking crisis, it's a fiat crisis because the crisis of having everything centralized in one place and them all screwing it up in the same way at the same time and lying to everybody with uncheckable things. Every single thing that the most intense Bitcoin maximalist would say, you know, for example, I posted that meme of, you know, you could sell your Bitcoin for millions someday. He's like, Neo, when you're ready, you won't have to. 
right? Because like selling for a trillion Zimbabwe dollars, right? So hyper-Bitcoinization, which is the simultaneous rise of Bitcoin and transition to reserve currency and the crash or other fiats against it, is going to be a huge mess. Um, because I think it's going to come much faster than people think. Because with all this printed money, we've got about three months before this CBDC gets out there where you're still a free man, you know, and you might be able to wire it out and you might be able to turn some of it into BTC and hold that locally. And that is basically the way, like th that is a way that we might preserve some degree of freedom on the other side of this. Because either it's a, go ahead. I know that sounds, see, so, I don't normally talk like this, right? No, 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 no. I, I know yeah. you don't. That's why I wanted to talk yeah. to you about this. So I, I think a key question, and, and uh, uh, I should blame you because once you put out this bit signal, I have somehow become a half spokesperson for Balaji. I literally have gone on podcasts and they're asking me, what is Balaji doing? I have no clue, so I figured you could explain for yourself. But the other thing is in private, there's people who uh, I think follow your work and they're like, look, Balaji usually doesn't have this type of language. Balaji usually isn't you know, this public in terms of some of the things that he believes. And so that makes them pay attention. When you made the bet, the $1 million Bitcoin price in 90 days, help unpack. In that bet, are you saying hyperinflation in the United States or are you saying, no, whether hyperinflation or not, people are going to start to exit and therefore they are going to buy Bitcoin and it will push the price to a million dollars in 90 day period? Like, How do you think about, let's go through kind of, if your vision of what is about to happen occurs, what does that world look like over the next 90 days? What I think is either, so the reason I did the bet was to get people to the Bitcoin lifeboat. Buy Bitcoin, get your keys off exchanges, get to a Bitcoin-friendly jurisdiction. That is the message. Buy Bitcoin, get your keys off exchanges, get to a Bitcoin-friendly jurisdiction. Um, everything else I say is a rationale for that, right? But that's what the message I'm getting out there is. I'm basically burning money to do this. It is not something that I'm... I mean, the thing is, I believe in Bitcoin, but I also believe in the public good. And that's going to be something that's in short supply and what follows. If what I'm saying is correct, and I believe it is, that the central banks... And, the, and like the US government has betrayed people on this level, right? Such that they just blew up huge amounts of people's savings, okay? And you couldn't even trust the banks. I mean, like, obviously you knew you couldn't trust the banks, quote unquote, in 2008. But the degree to which, you know, it's like the South Park episode, you know, hey, blah, 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 it's gone, right? You know that thing, right? That's that's mm -hmm. literally what we're talking about. Or or like, you know, South American kind of bank. You trust a South American bank? Now, maybe in this century you do, you know, the flippening, just like it was from like Russia to China, like China is now the senior partner, or from Britain to India, India is now the senior partner. It's quite possible that in this century, it's like this is South America's time to shine because they understand currency crises, they understand the value of Bitcoin. El Salvador, you know, his model is now something that he could export over, you know, South America. You could have, you know, who knows what happens and, and what follows. I actually think Bukele becomes a pretty important person in the world. Actually, um, El Salvador might become one of the richest countries in the world with with all the Bitcoin they've got if this happens. Okay. Um, but, but basically what I did was uh, most people were not, this financial crisis was creeping up like a, like a panther or like a, like a cloud enveloping people. They weren't even aware of it. It was just invested so much in stealth mode that whether, you know, people were just sleepwalking, it just wasn't a topic of conversation and so on. Now, this is something that's cut through the noise and everybody is aware that there is a financial crisis on and that the banks don't have your money that the money is gone, right? And that you should probably exchange some of it into Bitcoin and you should do that sooner rather than later because um, you don't know. It, it, you, we all don't know. It's just hard to predict timing on anything. But they have announced the July launch of the CBDC and that feels like as good a deadline as any. They've been killing the crypto rails, right? They killed Signature. They killed Silvergate. There aren't that many ways out. And so what I wanted to do was say, get Bitcoin, get your friends and family to get Bitcoin, get your coins off exchanges and do that now because they might close the doors. They might bar the exit. Now, the thing is, the good thing is they won't be able to bar it worldwide because the US doesn't have control over all banks worldwide anymore. There's like UAE and Saudi and so on, but they still do have control over quite a big chunk of it. And, uh, you know, one way of thinking about it is, you know, I was born an American and I, um, I, it, I'm doing this because I actually love American values. You know, Paul Revere, the printing is coming, right? The printing is coming. That's literally what we're talking about, right? The printing is coming. This is a, you know, another American analogy. This is a digital Pearl Harbor on all dollar holders. 
The dollar holder is a bag holder. Okay. And I mean that literally, you know, what's funny is, you know, I, I, the funny thing about this is I sound now like the most intense maximalist ever, right? I don't know what. Yeah, Pump? you you do, but but the reason why I'm laughing is because uh, what you're saying is actually very little to do with Bitcoin, right? Like yes. you are basically looking at the traditional financial system, and you are saying there are major problems here, and I don't give a shit if you care about Bitcoin or you don't care about Bitcoin, but you have to identify what the problems are and then make the decisions for yourself. Oh, by the way, I Balaji you believe that Bitcoin is the best solution. But some other people may go buy real estate or buy whatever asset that they think is better. But first, you have to get them to identify the problem before they even begin to think about a potential solution. I know. But even then, I think, yes, the reason I'm saying Bitcoin, and as I said, I'm a maximalist for now, for the, for like for digital wartime, right? Bitcoin only. And the reason is that real estate and other kinds of things like that, um, may, maybe real estate and red states, I guess, but lots and lots of fiat stuff is you know what happened to the Russians or the Canadian truckers, right? Their stuff yes. was just seized, right? So I have a feeling that as these banks all melt down, right? The most trustworthy things out there, I mean, your your business checking account isn't secure. And if you want it back, that's a bailout, right? This kind of crazy stuff, which what it does, by the way, see a normal predator, when it walks up to you, like, or it's running at you, it looks, got fangs and sharp and you're like, oh, and then you, you know, you fight back against and you have legitimate self-defense. Imagine a predator that like could, you know, anesthetize you, you know, like a mosquito in a sense, and it sucks your blood and you don't even know it's there. Right. Um, that's kind of like these, these finance guys, these bankers who will take your money and tell you you're bad for resisting. You know, they're like, you know, again, it's it's something where uh, natural selection operates at many different levels. Obviously, it operates at the level of the physical and visible kind of thing, but also operates at the level of ideologies and even business practices, right? If um, if they had not ad adopted those kinds of things, then um, they would be more easily spotted. Oh, yeah, well, this says send all my money to so-and-so place. No, thank you very much, right? And so the funny thing is, all kinds of maximalist impulses, like distrusting contracts, distrusting, you know, complicated things. I want simple things. Like lots of those impulses are going to be good impulses in what follows, you know, like minimum necessary complexity. Um, we're basically the whole definancialization of this gigantic kind of thing may happen actually really fast as tons of banks go down and so on. And we'll see what happens, right? Talk a Let little bit, there. talk a little ahead. bit about. Yeah, talk a little bit about the speed at which this has happened previously. So, you know, for example, I know somebody yeah. uh, who lived in a country where there was hyperinflation. It literally happened in sixty days, right? It went from everything's yeah. fine to bam, hundreds of percent of inflation. Explain a little bit as to why you think this uh, kind of combination of historical hyperinflation and the speed at which it happens, combined with what I call the digital catastrophe, right? This kind yes. of speed of information and action can then almost accelerate at an even faster pace. That's right. So first is hyperinflation table, right? This Look at the speed of this. This is hours to days, right? It's really, 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 really fast, okay? Um, second is the digital bank run, right? So um, here is actually, right? Social media driven bank run killed Credit Suisse. 10 billion in a day, 12th deposit, SUB collapse from asset size of 5 billion. CO blames Twitter, right? Social media rumor. Okay. So um, so basically, digital bank runs are, they're not built for that. All Dodd Frank assumes people come in in person, right? So the system isn't set up for something from this angle, right? Um, so one is that hyperinflation. Two is, third is just look at you know some of these stocks, right? First Republic Bank. Here, look. This was this was like pretty legit bank for a long time, seemingly, right? Um, look at that. Look at that. Is that that? See, it's continuous, and it looked thought that they were getting really rich, and then dead. Right. Everybody knew that this was fake, but it's like kind of accelerating your entire life and then ending it. That's what the Fed did. You know, it's like just just look at that. What that felt like going from that to that, right? That's the printing and that's the, you know, rate hiking. And like, you know, I'm not saying this is a normal business cycle, but they went bananas and the, you know, just, you know. So the thing is, that's First Republic, all right? 
here is uh, you know Silicon Valley Bank, right? Look at that. Again, it's continuous and it's just digital and dead at the end. Okay. Here is um, the the so-called uh, the so-called discount window. And again, they make all this stuff. You know, give all these various names. So, so look at this. This looks like. Here's another thing. It's like, you know, there's like some little wrinkles and so on. And then that's 2008. This is Corona. Discount window is already just far beyond anything. There's a little bit of, you know, kind of thing. This is just, does that look like a normal graph? No, of course not. And then no. also, I think that there, there's another yeah. piece to this whole thesis that um, hasn't really been called out a lot. It's like the central bankers learned a playbook in 2008. They perfected it during uh, coronavirus 2020. And now it's like they're in the big leagues. And when they see that fat, you know, fastball coming down the middle of the plate, they can swing with all their might. And so as you see in this chart here, like they're swinging. They just gave back a third of everything they sold off their balance sheet in a year. Half, they gave it back half. in literally one week. Half, I think it's half. Half <laughs> of all the QT in one, right? Uh, that was, this is the last screenshot. Who knows? It's at like, it's like 5X that by now. Who knows, right? Um, and, and they also, by the way, they, 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 uh, they lie like they breathe, right? Because every single thing they say, you have to like translate fed speak where it's like, you know, they, they lie in certain ways where if you're, um, you know, uh, I'll give a great example, like, um, okay, look at this, right? March 12th, we're only going to print 25 billion. Now it's 2 trillion, four days later. How about that? And it's actually, what it actually is, is infinity, Right. And uh, so, so you know, th this graph no longer looks that crazy anymore relative to the discount window stuff, right? Like these, um, you know, they, they, they look the same. And the thing is, everybody's known that this was going to happen. One of the, I think one of my contributions in all of this is reframing this as not like some tech guys thing or whatever, but as like the final big debt crisis that Dahlia predicted, right? Everybody knew this would come. But not exactly how and when. And the Fed didn't have strategic surprise, but it had tactical surprise. And again, whether it's a intentional or emergent, doesn't matter, right? TLDR is they are now doing that digital devaluation of the dollar. And so now what's going to happen, I think, is now that the fire alarm has been rung. Um, hopefully, you have something where only dollar holders pay for the sins of the dollar. Okay. So everybody, because if you think there's multiple tribes in the US, there's blue tribe, red tribe, gray tribe, like Sky Alexander's, there's foreign tribes, right? So hopefully everybody who doesn't fully trust the banks and the US government hedges into Bitcoin to a greater and greater extent. Um, and we'll see exactly how that manifests. And then they'll have like, you know, they'll print so much that probably prices of, you know, bread and other kinds of things will go up versus the dollar. And that's when you know th things start to get pretty nasty, right? Um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I mean, the big thing is, by the way, when you go back and watch this video, Dalio has cartoons in there, and he does that. It's very well done, but it means that you feel like it's something happening to people at a faraway time and place, and people don't panic or freak out or whatever. But then watch those, and then replace those cartoons with the assets going to zero and people being in conflict with like real photos in your head, and it feels very different. You know what I mean? Like no one cares today about the collapse of the Dutch or whatever, because that was hundreds of years ago. It's a different thing when it's like happening to you, you know? Let me pause there. So I have a couple of questions that uh, now that people understand, you know, how we got here, what the Fed is doing, what you think will happen kind of moving forward. Um, maybe the first place to start is you said this a couple of days ago now. I have had people across tech, finance, Bitcoin, you know, crypto world, whatever, reach out to me and ask some version of, is Balaji serious? What is he thinking? Do you agree with him? What percentage likelihood do you think it is? Whatever. From your standpoint, have you had people from the traditional financial world reach out to better understand this? Or is it still an internet thing? And it's basically the community of people who know you from the internet? Or have you now started to have this narrative and this uh, kind of idea seep into the traditional financial world where people are starting to pay yeah. attention? So I'm aware that several large billionaires have started buying Bitcoin. No, not started, like like have they see the thing is this set of facts that I put together over here is a like this is not crazy. 
right? This is a set of highly, this is a well-documented essay with links, graphs, and charts that makes sense. It tells a story that makes sense, that predicts both past, uh, I mean, like that, that makes sense of past events and predicts future events. And it puts all the pieces together as to what happened and why it happened and what's going to happen. And it leads to a terrifying conclusion, which is all the banks are dead and we're going to find out one bank rate at a time. Like what they've, what they've decided to do is to monetize the debt in the most chaotic way by having it be first come, first served. Okay. They print tons of money and all the banks have your money. But the only person who has a purchasing power is a person who turns into Bitcoin first. That's it, right? The purchasing power is being eroded silently with this print, right? And um, because this is like the last print, you know, they've just, they have monetized the debt. So insofar as they made a contribution, it was that. And to your, to your question, yes, uh, I mean, like there's a zillion people who called and messaged or whatever. And all I've done is I've said, you know, the first thing they're like, are, you know, some people, well, actually the people who know me know that I'm not, I, you know, you know me for, I don't know, five years, 10 years, something, something in that range, right? I'm not a yes. John McAfee kind of guy, right? There's, there's only one other time I've ever rung the fire alarm and that like on, on this level. And that was early COVID. And the reason I did it then was the same reason I did it now is because I took the hit of having being like, you know, execrated for weeks as a racist, blah, 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 blah. Oh my God, you're such a racist for saying it's coming from China. Like this kind of insane stuff, you know, oh my God, you know, you're so paranoid, blah, blah. At the time, by the way, and here's the thing, by the way, about COVID. Today in 2023, people believe two things. Number one, China had a virus that leaked out of a lab that infected more than 700 million people worldwide and killed 7 million of them, sickening tens of millions of others. And they covered it up. And that's so terrible and it's bad. True. Of course, you know, NIH actually also funded China. So like the US was also involved. It's like this terrible kind of thing, right? The gain of function research, all this stuff. And number two, it wasn't that big a deal. Life went on. COVID's over, right? So now the thing is, I actually agree with both the statements. But at the time in early 2020, if you go back and look at the number of deaths, it was growing exponentially like that. And nobody was paying any attention to it. And it was an empirical question that it managed to top out at about 7,000 deaths per day rather than like 70,000, right? So, I, you know, like if you go back and look at my tweeting, I basically stopped tweeting about it around the time they started saying, oh, you know, race related, you know, was it racism is a real pandemic or some, something, you know, insane like that, right? Remember the, the riots and so on. Once people just started going, losing their minds, I did not tweet about it anymore. What I wanted to alert people to was this was a real thing. The problem is that while the tech, you know, and of course people will argue about this. So one thing I'll find is there's a lot of people who believe both that China's super evil for letting this leak out of a lab and it's just the flu. It wasn't a big deal. It was not just the flu. It just it was a novel virus that killed a lot of people, right? We, uh, you know, I uh, you can argue about which vaccines are good and you know so on. I think probably what it is is that getting COVID was so bad that a vaccine that gives some percentage of people similar effects to COVID, it's as if they were infected with COVID and it's at larger scale. That is my rough belief, right? So that it's probably uh, better to get um, the vaccine than to get it. But I know that people will differ on this and argue on this and so on. I'm not here to litigate that. What I am here to say is that. The early stages of COVID, I think that there absolutely was something happening and there were a lot of changes that were going to happen. And that's what I kind of flagged, right? Um, as for now, uh, I think this is going to be something similar where this is something that uh, the full consequences of lots of you know Western banks being dead, uh, lots of money being printed, and a CBDC and, and a lot of consolidation in a CBDC... I don't know exactly what they're going to be, but they could be even worse in some ways. Because if you have a CDC, you just can't get your money out ever, maybe, right? Depending on how much level of control is, you may not ever be able to get it out. And if you can't ever get it out, they might not let you buy a plane ticket. They might, there's so many things that they would do to people who are politically disfavored without saying anything that uh, it would be pretty, pretty nasty, right? Anyway, let me pause there. All right. The next question that a bunch of people, when I told them that we were going to do this, uh, were asking me is, what is your best argument for why you're wrong? Or what is your best argument for why the US dollar will not inflate away and it will continue to be the global reserve currency? The best argument for... So I actually don't think... All right, well, um, let's do a few. 
What's my best argument for why I'm wrong? I think the best argument for why I'm wrong is probably that this will happen, but it'll be over a longer time scale and it won't be that fast. And this is not the final crisis, but it's the precursor to the final crisis or the, you know, the final crisis will be in a few years or something, right? Something about it feels different though. And the reason it feels different is it's a consumer facing crisis. In the sense of all the previous ones were enterprise crises, you know, like you just read in the news that bankers were worried and anxious and sweating and so on. You didn't have 40,000 companies and all of their employees all at the same time, completely panicking that they that their entire life's work would go to zero because, you know, supposedly they're, you know, like, and it was blamed on them, you know, like that, that you didn't have something like that, right? That is something that causes a fundamental distrust in the US banking system. Moody's downgraded the banking system. In many ways, America is already Argentina, okay? Now, so why am I wrong? If I'm wrong, I'm wrong because it takes longer for inflation to propagate out than I think. Because I think now they have printed so much money that it's a matter of time. But I want to be wrong in a sense because, uh, and I'll probably post this when I post a bet, like I hope I don't win, okay, in that sense. because. Um, what this is, is a way to call attention to this stealth financial crisis. And, you know, it's, it's like prepping, you know, it's like buying a gun or whatever. You hope you don't have to use it, but you better be prepared because you might, you know, so mm -hmm. buying Bitcoin and getting to a jurisdiction that is Bitcoin friendly, that has, you know, Texas GOP has this thing, shall not be infringed, right? The right to buy, sell, send, and receive Bitcoin shall not be infringed. Mississippi, Montana, they have right to mine bills. Tennessee, Wyoming have the Dow laws. Obviously, Florida, you know, is, is pro-Bitcoin. Um, and I kind of think what will happen is a potential dividing line in the not too distant future will be, there'll be states that don't, blue states that don't allow individuals to hold Bitcoin, only the government can, like gun bans, right? And red states that allow individuals to hold Bitcoin. And I think that's going to be, now, of course, when I say Bitcoin, maybe it's lightning or something like that. You know, we all, all that is to be figured out. Obviously, transactions, volumes, all those stuff that's important. Um, and uh, anyway, there's, there's way more I could say, but let me let me stop there. So when you mention Bitcoin and kind of, uh, you know, Second Amendment, uh, it makes me think of Jason Lowry and uh, the thesis around like the soft war and basically Bitcoin being this, you know, projection of power um, and something that the United States uh, should go ahead and embrace. Given the existing financial situation, it, is it your recommendation that the central bank should immediately go buy Bitcoin as a hedge against their own devaluation of the fiat they currency? Would or do you think they would never, ever, 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 ever do that? Just these guys being with it. it. It's it. They have an economic theory that could not predict the existence of Bitcoin. And I mean, really what that, that's what this is. It is, do you trust Powell or Satoshi? That's literally what this is, right? Um, and you know, people have said, you know, the Fed is more powerful than the president and so on. If Bitcoin becomes the global reserve currency, that is a changing of the order. It is a different. It is a different world after that, right? So they would never. Um, they would never. I, maybe I don't know. I doubt it. I've never seen a central banker that likes Bitcoin. Um, there's some that understand it, but they don't like it because it's the one thing that they can't manipulate on their keyboard. It's the one thing they can't seize or freeze. You know, they, they're almost like a video game developer. Points here, points there, and so on. Except there's consequences in the real world. You know, you can make a game more interesting by adding certain points, but making people dance in the real world, you know, by just sloshing numbers around in a spreadsheet is is not fun, right? For the person who's having to dance in such a way. Like these people who are faked out by, oh, rates are going to be low, rates are going to be low, whoa, rates are so high. And they all just crash, blah, 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 gigantic pile up of bodies at the base of that cliff, you know? Um, so no, I, I think you know I haven't read Lowry's thing. I, I saw it online. I think the basic issue by with a lot of those guys who I like is that they just have a romantic image in their head. I mean, the thing is, you know the thing for my network state book, like God, state, and network. It's like yes, what is Leviathan, right? What is the highest power? And a lot of philosophies actually reduce to this, even unconsciously. Is the highest power Almighty God? Is it? the you know the military the state like the us military or the chinese military if you're in china or is it encryption right 
And uh, the thing is that I think a lot of people just still project onto the current US government what it was as opposed to what it is. You know, it's like it's been silently corrupted in some ways, not that silent actually, but it has the same flag and it has the same this. It's got, it's like, um, you know, Scott Alexander talks about the skin suit wearer, right? Like something kills something and wears its skin, you know? So it's got the skin of the old America, but the substance is like some demon that's inhabited it. And, you know, that has gotten all the banks to tell you that it's your fault if the money is gone. Right. And, um, you know, by the way, all these FDIC things, you know, the, like you used to have like small bank bankruptcies. You didn't used to have like gigantic hundred billion dollar banks with no warning go absolutely to zero. Right. That's new. That's like not, you know, that's a 2008 crisis, but that's not what like a well run system is supposed to be. It's not going to, and, uh, it's a systemic thing, you know. Probably, by the way, one thing I think about, you know, it's, there's there's a libertarian theory that I, um, I never got that into, but now I'm much more into it, and that's, you know, basically the Fed is serial killer, right? If you go back in time, probably if you go and look at the mortgage crisis, you can find the fingerprints of the Fed, and probably every every crisis you can find the fingerprints of the Fed injecting all this variability, and then everybody else dies and a bunch of bodies at the end of the cliff. And the Fed keeps playing their games, interest rate up, interest rate down, interest rate up, interest rate down, pretending that injecting all this chaotic cyclicity and craziness in is adding value somehow when it's actually just joysticking you know, the system. And they would never give up that control because it makes them feel important. And how could we not help people or whatever, right? And the control would have to be taken away. And that's what Bitcoin is. All right. Let me pause there. So another piece that I think people are interested in is the nation state versus the state. We just saw today uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He gave a press conference. He said that he is going to propose legislation to outlaw the use of CBDCs in the yes. state of Florida, both domestic and foreign. Put aside for a second whether he legally can do it or not, because I saw much of debate of that on Twitter. But this idea that like, some of these states may not wait for federal guidance and they may actually go against the nation's yes. interest. How do you kind of balance that? Well, so one thing I've, and I've got a ton of graphs on this, but basically, actually, let me show some of these, right? So I've been tracking this for a while. And what most people don't know is that um, the 10th Amendment has basically been coming back, okay? So in the sense that um, states breaking away from the feds. Blas, you are an expert Googler. Am I? Yeah. Yes. Well, here we go. So, um, first of all, states have already been breaking away from the feds. You know, right of the people to own, hold, and use. You know, shall not be infringed. Right. And um, all right. So states are setting their own um, sanctuary. So sanctuary state laws. These have been going on for a long time, and um, some of them are to the left, and some are to the right of the federal government. Right. And uh, you know. Here, marijuana laws, okay, they differ. Uh, gun laws, abortion laws, right? All of that stuff mm -hmm. differs quite a bit from state to state, and it's getting more so, right? And um, the thing about this is, you know, here is, you know, Wyoming, legal DAO recognition, Colorado, first state to accept crypto for taxes, Miami, crypto capital of the world. Like crypto is a political issue and states will literally split on crypto as to whether they are a fiat state or a crypto state. Like that's like a fundamental difference. In fact, I actually think in what comes after this, after the fiat crisis, I think you're going to see a lot of the fiat economy, all the derivatives and so on, a lot of that just melts down, you know, basically it just, just all poof. And I don't know who gets what money. And you have essentially um, fiat states, maximal states where it's Bitcoin only. And then crypto states, which have, you know, Bitcoin plus, right? But all three of them will value Bitcoin and will all like fight over it. And then the question is whether Bitcoin itself, um, see, because gold, I mean, gold will also be valuable in that world, but as like a state to state thing. Uh, Bitcoin itself then is going to actually be under, you know, the serious stress test and we'll see what happens. Um, go ahead. You're going to say. No, my, uh, I think my last question for you is um, when you look at, this entire situation playing out 
you're raising the alarm. You're, you're kind of sounding the alarm. You've put the bit signal up. You've got people from all walks of life that are starting to pay attention to it. If you had to guess now, 90 days, a year out, whatever kind of time frame you want, how many people do you actually think will listen? I don't know. But I do know that at least I feel that I did my duty to warn innocent Americans that, I mean, there's a tradition on both the American left and right of being suspicious of the American government, right? Where it's on the left when it's Cointelpro and all these people wiretapping and so on. Or if it's on the right, you know, when it's like, don't tread on me, libertarianism, right? There's a healthy suspicion of the state. And both left and right libertarians are within kind of our crypto community. And that's a strain of, you know, Americanism has been there for a long time. And so, you know, essentially I think of it as, you know, there's, there's basically four options, right? One is you just go back to sleep, watch TikTok, don't do anything. Okay. Two is, um, you, this is a false story. You wire all your money to a big bank. Now you think you're safe, 5% interest, great. A lot of people will fall through the store because they just don't get it. Then the trap shuts in like July or whenever the CBDC, and then they cannot withdraw their money and they're stuck. And they're like, I trusted them. No, right. And that's, you know, right. Then third, you get to Bitcoin, at least some, you're hedged, right? You're, you're hedged into Bitcoin. But fourth, you want to also be in a Bitcoin friendly jurisdiction because otherwise you're going to have problems being in a, in a, in a, having Bitcoin when everybody else doesn't. Right. Um, and so I don't know what, like of the people where they land at one, two, three, and four. So I think that's fair. We'll see. What, um, I, I lied. I actually have one more question for you. Sure. Of course. What is the one, what is the one thing that you're looking for moving forward? What is the milestone? What is the data point? What is the thing that you'll be like, yes, this thesis is on track uh, if you see it happen? Is it more banks failing? Is it you know more QE, balance sheet expansion? Like, What are you looking at? Well, the thing is, the way that they've, they're doing this printing, the, the question is whether or not we actually see... With the, they have managed to get it to the system to the point that people are scared about whether their money's in the bank. And they print it to make sure that if you come and do a bank run and you move your money, that you still have it. So the the, um, the fundamental thing would be, I mean, certainly the Bitcoin price going up would, you know, we'll see when it, if and when it starts mooning, right? And um, and maybe people need to get their wires to exchanges or something like that. But fundamentally, it's going to be individuals, and then it's going to be um, firms, and then it's going to be. Uh, you know, like funds. And then eventually it'll be, I think, small sovereigns. Like Naib Bekele and Jack Dorsey um, getting involved would be pretty important um, because they also have a pretty big megaphone and, and whatnot. And there's a feedback effect because the more the price of Bitcoin goes up, and it's now shown the true decoupling, if you saw that, right? It's finally decoupled from all the other assets. Um, so, and we're talking about people moving huge amounts of money at once, right? They're moving their like entire bank accounts right? So those are large purchases and a large percentage. I'm not saying, you know, it obviously depends on each person and what their percentage is and so on. Um, it, you know, you, you obviously need to pay your bills and fiat. Don't, you know, don't invest something foolish or what have you, but it's, it's, it's something where you should just hedge, hedge what you can. And again, it's not about like making money. Um, it is about not losing money about saving money it's just it's the flip of what people you know how people think about these markets so it's it is it actually is much closer to the maximalist worldview you know so anyway let me pause there Blasi, i appreciate you doing this i know that you and i both are exhausted and uh, probably gonna fall asleep as soon as we hang up so i appreciate right. you taking the time to do this i think there's a lot of people who are very interested in uh in your views and uh uh if anyone is not following you on twitter they absolutely should and we'll definitely do this again in the future all right. Thank you, sir.